Welcome everyone uh, to the second webinar in our emergency food planning series. My name is Florence Pardo from the Food Foundation um, and it's a pleasure to be welcoming you um, today. Um, just to remind you, we are recording the session, so please uh, keep your cameras off if you don't wish to be recorded. Um, please keep yourselves on mute throughout the session, um, apart from when we have a discussion later where we hope you'll all be off mute plenty and uh, getting stuck into the discussion. Um, at any point during the session that you um, would like to ask a question, please do drop it into the chat and we'll, um, we'll be handling questions throughout the session, but we'll have our main discussion towards the end. Um, and I'm going to hand straight over to, uh, to Kim, who is going to be uh, facilitating today's session. Kim is the founder of the Feeding Cities Group, which is a social enterprise dedicated to uh, creating more resilient urban food systems. And she's our lead consultant in designing and managing this webinar series. So Kim, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Florence. And I also want, you know, I want to thank Florence. These webinars would not happen without her, both as a thought leader and all of the logistics for it. So, so huge thank you to Florence and our other thought leader at the Food Foundation, Shaleen Malou, I saw her join. So I wanna give a shout out to her. So thank them both. Uh, as, as I think Florence, you mentioned, all materials will be shared after the webinars, including this recording. Uh, so please focus on the, the, the discussion. And we have some questions here, but we really hope you'll enter into chat discussions and we'll have time after every speaker for some Q&A. We also have an optional hour at the end of the webinar for anyone who can stick around and engage in further dialogue, more informal dialogue with all of the speakers and all of us. So please, you're all welcome to do that. The, if we can go to the next slide, Kelsey. Oh, and, and I wanna introduce Kelsey Nordine who's my partner here at the Feeding Cities Group. And uh, many of you may, may know, especially all of the speakers. So without her help on logistics, we also wouldn't be here. So big thanks to Kelsey. So the motivation for this webinar series, this is the second webinar series uh, for Food Cities 2020. And, and really it's a fact very, city, very few cities plan for any type of event in terms of food. Uh, most cities believe the private sector will take care of it or the NGOs, voluntary sector or international NGOs, uh, which isn't exactly the case. And we'll talk about that in a bit. But uh, what we hope is that everyone will take the planning more seriously and we're giving them strategies and tactics to do so. So these webinars are very practical oriented. All right, Kelsey, next slide. So we framed up this series in terms of looking at the different causes or crises that create emergency food problems. Because if you look at the crises, right, it's going to cause different issues. So we dig into the causes in order to find the right solutions for and the right planning for emergency food. So the first one was around the pandemic. Please go look at that if you weren't there all, all online. This one's on refugees, migrants, et cetera. And the next two up are natural disaster and vulnerable food supply. I'll see if we want to go to the next. So the other way we framed it, and the, re the reason we picked those four particular problems is that they need new solutions, right? The pandemic was unprecedented and solutions were being developed in real time around it. So we tried to capture some of those that were working and introduce people to how do you plan for that in the future? Is it the last pandemic? We'll see. I don't think anyone's betting on that, right? The refugees, natural disasters, Similar types, solutions have been developed for these problems, but the problems changed. It's changed in scope and size and duration. So some of our thinking around the solutions that have been developed, we need to rethink. And, and we'll hear today from Titiana and the World Food Program and how they're adjusting to that. And then our next webinar on natural disasters and some of the big institutions like the food banks. And finally, the vulnerable food supply. Right? There's vulnerabilities in new areas. The US is finally acknowledging that they have some vulnerabilities in their food chain, for example. And historically vulnerable areas, the chronic, chronic food insecure areas, such in parts of Africa, right? they've never been solved. So thinking, new, new thinking there as well. Great. Kelsey, if you wanna to go to the next slide. Are you frozen? Again, another, you know, it's not just the webinar, 
We also have these learning platform resources, so we want to make sure they're highlighted for everyone. Every webinar for every webinar, um, our team combs through all of the research out there, the resources out there, and we we you know find those that we think are particularly relevant to cities and offer different perspectives and different types. So we have some great articles, including a visual article here on this. We also develop a case study, very tactical, short read, really relevant for those trying to figure out how to plan for their cities. That's municipal strategies for feeding refugees over the long term. And it's a little bit deeper dive into some of the work that Fuat is going to talk about today in Kazantiep. Great, and I have the, the URL there for the, the learning platform resources. And with that, uh, I just wanna give you a quick overview of the speakers. So we are going to start with Tiziana. I'm gonna introduce her in a minute. And we have her colleague, Catherine, who's gonna talk about some work in Uganda and then Fuat, who's gonna talk about the great work that Santiap is doing in Turkey. A few questions there to help you start thinking um, about how this is relevant to all of you and, and engaging in chat, et cetera. Um, you know, what, we're, what we know to be true, uh, and, and again, our experts from World Food Program will talk about this, but the number of refugees globally increasing, they're landing in cities, they're staying for years. Is your city prepared for that? And is your city beginning to plan for this situation or not? And so please ask questions about anything you're hearing. Again, we'll have, we'll have ample time for, for Q&A. Great, and with that, I'm going to hand it off to our very first speaker, Tiziana Zakedu. Sorry if I mispronounced that, another Z last name. She's gonna kick off the webinar. She's currently assigned to the Emergency Operations Division at the World Food Program headquarters in Rome, where she provides operation and policy support to all of the country offices and regional bureaus involved in emergency response. Uh, she focuses mainly on East and South African regions. She has a background in international relations as well as state management, humanitarian affairs. She is not just a headquarters person, right? She spent most of her career out in the field. So it brings a wealth of experience. Thanks, Tiziana, I'll hand it off to you. Thank you very much. I hope everybody can hear me and I'll start sharing my screen. Great. Can anybody confirm that you can see it? Great. Okay. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm not going to dwell on more introductions um, and go straight to the point. I'm very, very glad to be here and, and very nice to be talking to all of you this afternoon. Uh, I'll be sharing my, my presentation with my colleague, Catherine, uh, who is based in Uganda and, and will speak more uh, of the day-to-day work we do in refugee operations. Unfortunately, last time I was in a refugee camp was uh, now three years ago. So uh, I'll stick to the general uh, general description of what WFP does in, in refugee assistance. Of course, everybody knows, uh, but as part of our mandate, we uh, are, are called to operate in refugee emergency assistance uh, for relatively large uh, refugee caseloads. So uh, typically uh, our mandate kicks in whenever 5,000 or more refugees are in a given country or in a given area. And uh, in that respect, uh, we are responsible for uh, food assistance, which we do through different, uh, different types of uh, modalities. Uh, what I wanted to really uh, sort of open my uh, presentation with is a little bit of uh, what was already mentioned in the introduction. So the number of refugees worldwide keeps growing and it's, it's quite staggering when you look at it. It's in 2020, UNHCR estimates there were more than 80 million refugees uh, and IDPs or forcibly displaced people. That includes almost 50 million IDPs. Uh, and that's one of the things that I wanted to, to make sure is, is clear. Uh, the vast majority of displaced people are displaced within their own country. Uh, and 
those who aren't, of those who aren't, the vast majority are hosted in neighboring countries next to their country, countries of origin, and so more, more often than not in developing countries. Uh, and, and of course, it's interesting to also see that more than two thirds of them come from the same five countries. So, you know, solving those issues uh, would actually in, in turn solve a lot of the displacement problems uh, for the long term. Uh, not all of the refugees are hosted in camps and not all of the refugees need assistance. Actually, camp based solutions, uh, as much as they are very frequent, they should be a last resort option because the refugee camp is, even the best of refugee camps, is never a nice place to live and never a good place for people to establish uh, a good life. Uh, still, there are a lot of refugee camps uh, in, in, in many different countries and uh, we provide assistance as, as best we can in, in those countries. But local communities, host countries, host towns uh, very often uh, shoulder the bulk of refugee assistance. And, and it's also important to, re to realize that a lot of refugees uh, kind of go back and forth from, from their own country to the neighboring country whenever the situation uh, the security improves or the food security sometimes uh, changes and so and they often especially uh, when they are coming from just across the border they share ties with the communities that are in the neighboring countries so they often go to communities that they already know where they sometimes speak the same language or are from the same ethnic group and that's where they find the first point of call uh, and that's why also why I said refugee camps are a point of last uh, resort in many cases. Uh, the other thing that's very important, especially for this audience, I think, is to know that, of course, all UN agencies, but also NGOs, uh, small and large, national and international, we all work in every country when the government requests it, allows it, and within the framework of what host governments decide is their uh, policy and their legal framework for uh, welcoming and hosting refugees. So all of our UN assistance is planned and is, and is managed in coordination with the government, which can be a good thing, can be a bad thing. What, what it does mean is that all, all of our operations are different because they have to adapt to this context and not just at the beginning, but constantly. So we're constantly engaged in conversations with the government, in collaboration. Some governments are very hands-on in uh, managing refugee uh, assistance themselves very directly. Some are a little less uh, strong or, or have a little uh, less resources available to do that and let us uh, do a bit more, but so every operation is very different and we constantly adapt to those frameworks. Those frameworks may also change. You can have a change of government, which changes the attitude towards refugees and you, you're constantly uh, in dialogue, constantly adapting your assistance. Um, the, the time perspective is also really of essence. Uh, it was already mentioned, refugees uh, are more and more, uh, it's never a temporary uh, or almost never a temporary thing being displaced. Uh, the average, I think, is currently estimated at 17 or 18 years of displacement. Yes. So once you become a refugee, uh, on average, you will stay for a very long time, up to decades uh, as a refugee. And in, in some cases, like uh, most famously possibly in Kenya, you have refugee camps where you have third generation refugees being born in those camps right, right now. So it's important, it, it, with hindsight, we could all plan better, but it's important to know that these are situations that will be protracted and that you need to have that in mind from the beginning and not just think that it's a temporary annoyance that will go away. Um, more, uh, and, and of course, the local communities, again, I want to say this here uh, because it will come back uh, as I talk. Refugees need uh, a set of service, a series of service, and especially in the context where WFP works, uh, those services cannot come from uh, the local community. So 
the impact that displacement has on the hosting community is something that is really important to take into account. Uh, just to mention the last, uh, the last operations I was involved in in Tanzania, you had small villages of 5,000 people and next to them a camp with 150,000 refugees. And assuming that those relationships, that that impact will go smoothly on its own is, is very wishful thinking. You need to be able to, uh, to have that dialogue also with the host communities. In some cases, provide those, extend the services that you provide to the refugees also to the host community because they are not necessarily much better off than the refugees themselves. Uh, I wanted. It was. I was planning to say this later, but I think it, it really needs to uh, to come out uh, here at the beginning. The numbers are high. The impact is really deep, and and the, sometimes the feelings also of the host communities can be really strong when uh, all of a sudden you have a large town being built around your your what used to be your village and your lands and your territory that you used to. Uh, draw resources from and, and maybe can't anymore or anyway has this new dynamic that you need to take into account. And of course, the, the impact on the environment can be also very, very considerable. Uh, the, the case of Cox's Bazaar was mentioned earlier uh, and, and I will mention it later also in my presentation. So the way we do our, our food assistance uh, is quite simple and yet very complex. Uh, we provide refugees in a typical camp or settlement uh, setup. We provide refugees with uh, what we call general food distributions, uh, which can take different forms. The classic form is in kind. Uh, that means that usually on a monthly basis, we, uh, we run a food distribution where we provide people with a basic set of food items. Uh, those That is calculated as, as the slide says uh, to cover 2,500 kilocalories per person per day. Uh, and it's basic in terms of uh, also the types of food that can be included in this basket. So of course, there is a long supply chain to, to reach uh, a refugee camp or a refugee settlement, say, uh, in southern Uganda. And so that means that the type of foods that we can provide in kind are dry foods and foods that have a long shelf life. Uh, it's, it's a lifeline for millions of refugees, so I'm not in any way berating it, but it is very basic. And again, if you are a refugee for 18 years, 20 years, 25 years, and month after month after month, you always receive the same food basket, it does create problems of acceptance. It, it does... You know, it, it comes with a lot of restrictions that don't necessarily make uh, your life as a refugee very nice. Um, and, and also there are cultural cultural uh, issues. For example, well, Katie is not a refugee context, but the food that we provide is usually a cereal, some kind of beans or pulses, oil and salt to cook them and flavor them. Uh, in Haiti, more or less every meal will be a basis of rice and beans and then something else. So when you are providing rice and beans and that is your meal, your recipients will look at you and go like, okay, you've given me the basis, where is the rest of the meal? Um, and so you run into a lot of, of, of difficulties. Uh, and, and, and of course it creates challenges of supply chain. You have to always make sure that you're, you know where your next uh, food is coming from, et cetera. So whenever it's possible and whenever uh, our assessment tell us that we can, we uh, like to provide what we call cash-based assistance. So as simple as that, we replace the food transfer with the equivalent in cash or if not possible in vouchers. Uh, of course, we make sure we have, a, we have developed this uh, very well over the years and now a lot of our assistance is provided in, in uh, in cash, and I think we estimate that you know, more than 7 million refugees just last year received uh, some form of cash assistance. Um, that means that you provide people with a ration that is calculated in uh, local value or with a voucher that they can spend in shops 
in the local market or in shops that we set up and and or facilitate for them. Uh, that would be called the vouchers. Uh, Cash-based assistance has a lot of advantages. Uh, of course, people can choose what to buy with the food, with the, the the cash that we give them. They can have a more variety diet. They can decide what to buy and when. They can make financial decisions. Uh, they can even make small savings. Uh, it's predictable and uh, it's it allows people to plan. Uh, when we do distribute in kind, we know that a lot of people only have uh, the WP food as a form of income of sorts. And so that food often gets up, ends up being sold and the cash used for other purposes. Because of course, as I was saying before, refugees have a, a broad range of needs and food is only one of them. And so when you provide cash, they can make those decisions already from the outset and you know they don't get shortchanged selling their food for uh, a cash equivalent that isn't always uh, at market value. So of Tatiana, course, maybe just like one more minute, and then we have to move on just because of time. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Uh, and so when you provide cash, uh, I lost my train of thought. Sorry about that. Um, you you are also contributing to the local economy, and therefore you are you are also providing a way for people to. Uh, improve relations between refugees and the host communities as i was saying before that's that's one of the big issues and of course with cash you can play around with technology you can provide uh, assistance in a way that is a lot more dignified that allows people uh, to feel a lot more empowered and a lot more able to make their own decisions about what they're eating and what they're feeding their family um, my presentation is much longer than this but i knew i wasn't going to be able to to describe it all uh, but one Sorry. thing that I really, really want to um, emphasize is the listening. So it is really crucial to be able to listen to refugees and plan based on what their real needs are. Uh, that is a very difficult job and we don't always do it uh, very well. But trying to understand how you can leverage your assistance to improve people's lives it has to start from understanding where people's lives start from and what it is that they need, what are their challenges, uh, what services you can use and you can provide that will maybe sometimes even with a marginal contribution improve their lives greatly. So uh, Catherine will speak to that a lot better and a lot more directly, but being able to uh, give refugees an opportunity to talk to us, to even to, to complain and, and to present their grievances really helps us to understand how we can adjust our program, how we can make them more, uh, more tailored, more targeted, better. And, and of course, mm -hmm. uh, we always provide food in the hands of women, uh, whether it's in kind or in cash-based uh, form. And again, with the cash, we see that there is also an opportunity to especially improve women's life, lives as they become more able to make those decisions uh, on how to feed their families. Okay. Um, I'll stop here and we'll be very happy to take any questions. Yeah, okay. thank you so much. And I think in the interest of time, um, we're going to hold questions until after Catherine speaks. So um, Florence, if you can tee up the video, we've also had somebody right call out in chat for a mute and I think it's been solved. So, oh, it may have been from Tiziana's microphone. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, just a reminder everyone to mute and we'll let Florence start the video. I'm not sure that bear with me one bear with me one second and I will just uh, tee it up sorry here we are ah there we go fantastic thanks Florence Traditionally, WFP provides food assistance to refugees in form of food, what we call in-kind. However, in response to COVID-19, WFP expanded its cash assistance to over nine settlements in Uganda. 
As WFP, we did not only expand with cash because of COVID-19. There were other reasons related to developing the economies of districts that host refugees. Providing cash to the refugees will boost the economy of the district because now there is that better trade. Our people are hardworking, they have products. Maybe they had that challenge of market, but now they are short in the market because the refugees have the cash. Then it will promote the peaceful coexistence. Because how do you really not love and respect your clients? So now there is that peaceful coexistence between the refugees and the nationals. As a result of cash expansion, we realized that we do not have these structures in the settlement, like the financial bank. So we introduced the agency banking so that refugees can come and pay out from the agents. Agency banking is not all over the settlements that we, where we operate. We have both agency banking as well as post bank that provides cash on wheels where refugees come and pick cash direct from the post bank. For protection purposes, we brought the agents closer to the people so that the refugees don't have to move far away from their houses to go and collect their assistance. Under cash modality, the refugee can swipe their card and buy food, just like they would do it in the supermarkets using MasterCards. Not all agents are at the same level of, of liquidity. So we have one big agent who is Moban Sako, who is our super agent as WFP, who works closely with Equity Bank. Moban Sako does the liquidity and then all the other agents come and pick cash from them and then they take to their small outlets where the refugees come and collect their cash assistance. Moban Sako is a member owned, member run and member managed institution we have managed to see a lot of positive changes towards the introduction of these cash-based transfers. There is an increase in savings, meaning that with the introduction of cash, it has made people to, to realize the importance of money. That they have realized they can set goals, set targets, and they, they can achieve. We realize that they are refugees who come from very vulnerable countries and so they may have had little or no knowledge on financial literacy. So we introduced financial literacy trainings where couples or a father and a mother come together to attend some of these sessions to be able to manage their cash assistance. Cash expansion together with market facilitation will help build resilience empower communities, but also move refugees from relief to self-reliance. <laughs>
Um, I know that in the video, um, my colleague Judith talks about the financial literacy, but to emphasize that there is also the aspect of capacity strengthening that is very um, useful if we are to talk of um, emergency planning, that um, the knowledge transfer that uh, WFP and other stakeholders pass over to um, the actors, and these include um, the NGOs that we work with, but most importantly, the governments from in terms of emergency preparedness to actual responses um, when disaster strikes or when um, the influx of, of new arrivals is experienced is also very critical. And then the other aspect that also comes out under the modality, in addition to the other two mentioned above, is the complementarity. Um, complementary activities that are done by different stakeholders. This closes, um, the, um, tries to bridge the gap between the food assistance provided vis-a-vis -vis the other needs of these households. As Tiziana mentioned, that if um, the minimum expenditure basket of a refugee is actually not made, um, uh, certainly even the assistance that is designed or um, passed over to the person of concern meant for food will actually um, end up meeting other needs because this is what naturally happens for anybody at a household level, depending on where the pressures are coming from. And so in, in the desire to ensure that the assistance that is meant for food actually ends up on food significantly, the biggest percentage, other actors uh, bring in um, other complementary activities that, um, that uh, fill up the gap on livelihoods. And um, back to the section of partnerships, it's important, I'll just add the voice to emphasize that um, the government at the refugee, let me, let's place ourselves at um, a refugee settlement in the Southwest. Um, and um, the leadership at that level is the office of the prime minister. In the different um, countries, it may vary, but for our context, it's uh, the office of the prime minister, that is the government arm, that is responsible to work with the um, UNHCR leading on the refugee response, plus the other actors, but critical role that the government plays is the coordination of all actors, which is very critical. Um, and so all the UN agencies, the NGOs, private sector, the financial service providers that WFP is working with to deliver the cash assistance as we move into the cash modality, the community structures, <coughs> all these are coordinated by um, the office of the prime minister, that's the government representative. But critical to note is the processes um, for us to be successful on uh, the day-to-day -day implementation that um, when refugee figures are given to World Food Program by, for purposes of those who might not um, really know the process, allow me just run one minute, the statistics on how many are actually um, recognized eligible refugees that are entitled to, to, to assistance. These figures, we get them from UNICEF and the government of, of Uganda. And so what WFP does is to ensure that um, these are actually verified um, at the time of before the assistance is actually um, given. And it's in line with just making sure that it's right assistance to the right people um, in the right quantities and um, at, in the right place for, for, for that matter. We also have um, a team, um, it's really joint efforts, working closely with UNHCR and the partners, um, issues of litigation, um, any errors that may occur um, in the identifying or verifying these persons, these are resolved through the litigation. Um, Tiziana talked about the AAP, um, which is the accountability to affected persons. This is a very critical component. Um, <laughs> In, this, in, the, in every settlement, um, we have a system in place that allows um, the persons of consent to be able to air out their views, concerns, um, any feedback, any form of feedback. And these are not just only WFP mechanisms in place. UNHCR has, the partners also have. We have partners on protection issues. So the, the avenues have been, um, been made available and the POCs, the persons of concern have been taken through this, through community engagements, through sensitization, through um, other uh, forums of um, community outreach um, activities, 
to ensure that um, program design, program improvements are actually enhanced by the feedback uh, mechanism that are in place. Um, why we also listed here the market facilitation, this was in response to, um, if I may give the example that during the COVID context, we stepped up, if you listen to the section of the video, we stepped up on the cash expansion as one of the measures to minimize the person contact because the verification is actually biometrically done. And so to minimize um, the contact, but yet ensure that assistance reaches out to the people, some of the distributions were actually um, done through agency banking. We scaled up on the agency banking, but also on some of the assistance was um, a double ration given out to, to the communities. But what we had to ensure as, as um, the VFP and partners is that the market is responsive to the increased um, the cash that is injected within the community. And so having the different market actors uh, brought on board and be able to respond to, to the demand um, helped to ensure that, um, and has continued to help to ensure that um, the community is still even in the midst of, of an emergency like the COVID context, they're still able to access the food commodities at the affordable prices like any other location, um, not just only in the settlements. And so join the connecting the farmers, the traders, the wholesalers, uh, the district local governments, and all different actors together to ensure that um, uh, refugees have access to the food was a critical component. Um, I think Tiziana also mentioned the robust um, monitoring and evaluation system. That's like the backbone of all the processes within the refugee settlement. <clears throat> because then it feeds into um, ensuring that um, the, um, we get feedback on whether the, among these, for instance, are the marketing price monitoring reports that are regularly done. So as we transfer the cash, if at all, in the community out there, the prices um, are fluctuating, then the feedback is got through the post distribution monitoring, the market price um, monitoring, and all other forms of assessments. And so then as actors were able to respond, not just as the VFP, but also the other actors, because these are reports that are shared among this, um, the other uh, uh, actors within the settlement through either the coordination, the interagency meetings, the other forums that are available. So I thought it's important to Thank emphasize you. that, um, <clears throat> as I conclude, it's important to emphasize, as um, Kim, you mentioned, um, that um, for emergency food planning, it's three things that are really critical. One, um, the involvement of the persons of concern, right from um, um, consultations, like from the design of every intervention, right from um, the start, and this can do through the community engagements and other, um, other, for, uh, up, um, other approaches that are there. So the people being at the center of the whole planning process is critical but also transferring the knowledge to the other actors uh, because today World Food mm -hmm. Program is there and any other NGO is there. But tomorrow um, the government should be able to respond to emergencies um, that may be even not to, um, okay. before they start calling on to us. And thirdly, um, incorporating uh, or integrating um, recovery or resilience um, um, interventions right from the onset of the emergency. Okay. So that we don't stay in the emergency mode for forever. Thank you. And Thank you, Catherine. You Thank you, Titiana. That's really wonderful. And and Fuat, we'll have you start sharing your screen now. Um, I know we always run over, but as you can imagine, you know, asking anyone to speak about the refugee situation in you know ten minutes or so is just about impossible. But thank you for that great overview of showing how complex it is. And now we're moving to Fuat, where in Gazantiap, right, this, this situation happened and he was on the ground um, at the municipal level and he'll talk about how they managed it and right, but, but essentially what we heard from WFP is how complex it is and all of this will go more smoothly, you'll be able to respond more quickly, the more awareness you have and planning you have in place, which I think Fuat would agree with. So Fuat, yeah. go ahead and share your screen. Okay, if you may. Yep. So hello again. Uh, I'd like to tell you about the um, governance and migration governance model in Gaziantep. Uh, due to the uh, Syrian crisis we have been experiencing in our region for the last uh, 10 years, 
we had to uh, evolve the governance model to a large, larger extent. According to the data of the Turkish Statistical Institution, the population of Gaziantep uh, in 2012 was determined around like 1.7 million people and projection for 2020, uh, 2023 was around 2.2 million. However, at the beginning of the uh, 2017, the, the total population, including the Syrians living in the city, exceeded uh, the number of 2023 projection by like exceeding 2.3 million. This un unexpected and rapid population uh, growth not only uh, increased the demand for social services, but also increased the need and demand in social services and AIDS. Uh, while these works were based on emergency response and humanitarian aid at first, they later became um, studies for capacity building and social development. Um, as a municipality, uh, what you can do to respond to these demands and needs is also very, very limited. So you should go beyond your traditional job description and be as flexible as the laws of, law allows. And you have to react fast. If your total city population increases by 20% in a few years, believe me, you cannot find uh, food to eat, water to drink, or even a house to live in. Uh, these reasons inevitably require you to make changes in your governance model. Uh, of course, you can't do it your way. The central government needed to, to change laws and regulations, enact new practices, uh, and laws for immigrants. Of course, these also took time, uh, but the difficulties experienced during this uh, change and transition uh, phase can also be very abrasive uh, and sometimes frustrating. Um, in order to, just a second. Oops. Oh, okay. Uh, in order to respond to these problems, we made an effective uh, planning with, within the municipality with the support of the central government. Uh, the work we carry out as Gaziantep has started to be accepted worldwide uh, with the great contribution of UCLG, United Cities Local Governments, as the Gaziantep model in migration management. At this stage, international networks such as Metropolis and UCLG, of which we are members, played a very important role in the promotion of this model and its acceptance by other refugee hosting countries. Um, I'm going to give you a very brief information about the pillars of Gaziantep uh, model and migration management. Um, the uh, key pillar here is the directorate of migration. What uh, the department does is uh, to provide effective social services on the basis of human rights and social justice to ensure coordinating of the municipal units working with Syrians, to ensure cooperation with international institutions, universities and NGOs, and to produce and execute needs-oriented projects. Uh, one of these pillars are uh, at the very beginning of the crisis, two Syrian information education centers uh, were established within our municipality uh, in order to prevent the lost generation, uh, lost generation and not to deprive children of education. The Ministry of National Education took these centers uh, which started to serve in 2012 as a model and expanded them throughout the country under the name of temporary education centers in 2014. Uh, for also Syrian guests, English, uh, com we established community centers. Uh, for Syrian guests, English, Turkish, Arabic courses in various fields, uh, basic lessons, uh, gymnastics, painting lessons, photography, children's club, computers, and some technology courses, guidance and consultancy services, and informative seminars were established. Um, Syrian volunteers uh, serve both Syrian and Turkish children, and an important step is taken in terms of social cohesion with refugees taking responsibility. Um, another one is uh, Women Development and Solidarity Center, we call it SADA. Uh, in the centers, Services are provided only for women. Various vocational training courses, language courses, psychosocial support groups are held, and information meetings are also held. Um, also, uh, another very important pillar is the training centers. Uh, there are 26 GASMEC, Gaziantep Artem Vocational Courses uh, centers, serving all of our citizens in the city and district centers of our municipality. Syrian guests receive services from these centers 
in the fields of uh, art and vocational uh, courses and language education. Thus, our Syrian guests will have better employment opportunities and the social cohesion uh, process will be accelerated. Uh, with the Social uh, Research Center, uh, which was established based on the motto that you can't manage what you cannot measure, a study is carried out to create a social risk map of the city by making individual visits to all neighborhoods in Gaziantep, especially the socioeconomically disadvantaged neighborhoods. Uh, regional needs analysis is made with the data obtained, and it is aimed to use limited resources in the best way. Uh, in addition, uh, studies are carried out for families in urgent needs of help. Uh, with, advent, uh, with advanced governance, our municipality is able to allocate its resources to uh, the region that need it most in the best way by making situation and risk analysis. It's aimed to develop social cohesion between the local people and Syrians and to develop and reveal the potential of the society, especially with the language education and vocational training opportunities offered uh, by the municipality and the transition of the Syrian uh, trained human power to social production the need for social assistance will decrease and the way for uh, a segment that produces and supports the society will be cleared. The increase of self-sufficient individuals with the provision of opportunities will also reduce the possible conflicts between both communities. The works carried out by Gaziantep Metropolitan Municipality are presented to both communities on the basis of human rights and social justice and focus on bringing out the potential of people ensuring that children receive an effective education and raising happy generations by ensuring social peace and tranquility. Uh, our work, especially with the United Nations after the crisis provide, provides us with an opportunity to increase our institutional capacity and helps us to gain a more professional corporate identity. Um, here, I'd like to also give you some uh, perspective of economical environments. Uh, and who are, just in the, sorry, just in the interest of time, because we're a little bit out of time, maybe sure. just two more in it, minutes here, but could you really skip to the parts around the food in particular and how? Yes, this I'm, I'm right there now. Perfect. Uh, the immigrants who came to Gaziantep uh, did not really um, generally experience any problems in their access to food in the short, medium, or long term. This is an agricultural and industrial city. Therefore, the uh, export sector is the most important building block of Gaziantep's economy. We did not give fish to people. We taught them how to fish. Um, many projects and structural changes were made in order to ensure the contribution of Syrians to this sector. We ensured the particip participation of people in the workforce with the vocational training provided. Thus, they earn their own living by earning their own money. In the projects carried out with the Chamber of Commerce, relevant ministries and NGOs, the businesses established by the immigrants were re registered. Uh, these businesses became taxpayers in the same system as the Turks and provided access to finance. They used microcapital loans from banks to establish businesses and raise capital. They have come a long way in their businesses. They again provided, uh, they again, uh, provided employment to Syrians to work in these jobs. They started to work in areas where the Turks did not work. In this way, uh, they counted serious support for local economic development. They contributed to the increase of Gaziantep's foreign trade in Arabic speaking geographies. They established their own business associations organized under the name of Syrian Economic Forum uh, currently, uh, there are over 2,000 registered SMEs, Syrian SMEs in Gaziantep. Uh, finally, it's really difficult to accept immigrants to host in your country, but uh, if you can use them as an asset in your country uh, and give them the opportunity to uh, make their own living, I think uh, not even food, the living in another country is not going to be a problem. So migration is not a problem to be solved, but the reality to be managed. So thank you thank very you. much. Thank you, Fuad. And what's so unique about Gazantiep and why we're featured them here and in the tactics to try is that it is that municipal level approach to that. So uh, Kelsey, if you can go ahead and, and share our last couple of slides as we wrap up and move to the optional one hour conversation. But it, it really is remarkable. So you heard about 
right, you had three presentations here. And when we dove into this idea of emergency food for refugees, it's one of the most complex situations. And it's not actually all about food, right? It's about thinking about the long term and their livelihoods, et cetera. So very complicated. So, you know, just some, some questions to get you thinking about what additional information do you need? Uh, would, what would you like to ask the speakers to think about how you might address these issues in your cities if you think it's a different situation than they're facing? As Fuat said, they're an incredibly, you know, they have an incredible um, benefit of being a big agricultural producer and, you know, the Fertile Crescent, well known for their diverse food. And, and so they had an advantage there and they did not have an issue with food shortages, but your city and region may not be as lucky. So maybe if we can, and please just enter it in chat and, and Kelsey and Florence will manage that chat. Anything there, Kelsey, that we wanna add? Not yet? Okay. Everyone's quiet this morning if you're in the US and we know it's late evening for others in these global webinars. Maybe the next slide, Kelsey. We also want your feedback on these webinars to continue to improve them. We have three more moving ahead. There's a whole other webinar series that the Food Foundation is planning. I have Florence's email up there. You can drop it in chat or send Florence an email. But what did you learn today that was new and useful? We'd love to hear that from all of you. If you can take a minute, enter it in chat, get us moving. What was new? Anything new here in the refugee situation? Anything you want them to dive into? Right, it's really hard for our speakers to know exactly who they're speaking to, especially when it's on Zoom. But these are, you know, we cannot uh, overstate the expertise you have available to you. Let us know if it was too long, too short, changing it up, etc. Looks like, <clears throat> excuse me, Tiziana has a hand up. Tiziana. Well, since the audience is shy. Uh, I thought, you know, thank you so much for it, because I think it, it was a perfect complement to what I was just describing. So you have a whole range of refugee assistance, which goes from refugees who are confined in a refugee camp with limitations as to how many hundred meters beyond the, 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 the camp they can actually walk from that and you know being entirely dependent on external assistance which is tremendously difficult to fundraise for so you have an enormous machine that only really works incredibly hard to provide a very very basic level of assistance to people who need everything and you know in in a country where i worked previously the government was even determining how how high the plants could be that refugees could plant in fear that if they planted anything that was even vaguely useful to them, they would end up staying longer in the country. So you can go from that to really making refugees part of your system, knowing that they're, they're there to stay, that if they want to go back home, it will be their first instinct to go back home because everybody wants to go back home if they are displaced and they have the ability to go back. They can become a resource. They can contribute to your economy. Your case maybe was especially lucky, but there are even there, there is a range of positive impacts that refugees can bring to communities. And it goes with planning. It goes with integrating those services. And it goes with also making sure that your local host communities are no, don't feel like they are losing at this game, but on the contrary, feel that They're this gaining. is all positive for everyone. Yeah, thank you for that, Tiziana. And, and Kelsey, we've got a couple of questions in chat that I want to get to. Maybe just put up the next slide as the background slide as we, as we go through those questions. So we have a question wondering um, about how rural remote regions that have limited food resources could prepare for an influx of refugees. And for this person, their situation um, has them with a population influx from wildfire evacuees. Mm big in the US. Yeah. Tiziana, I don't know if you wanna handle that. Yeah, sure. So I would think uh, what I was briefly touching upon earlier, uh, markets are a, a really big, uh, big help in that. Uh, what we do, of course, the situation in the US will be extremely different, but what we do, 
whenever we feel that we don't have the food available in the specific area, if we still believe that markets can support the extra demand that is brought by refugees, then we bring that market in. So instead of letting uh, refugees, in this case, use the market that is already in the area, we call on traders, we make sure that we vet them, we make sure that we check that they have the capacity, they have the staffing, they have the trucks, and they have the ability to bring in the amounts of food that we think are useful. And lo and behold, you know, everybody is always very concerned whenever cash-based interventions are introduced. And in the space of a few months, uh, you know, when, when we introduced cash in Chad, for example, in year one, we barely found any trader who wanted to work with us. Year two, despite the fact that the UN are, are you know, very slow, including very slow in, in refunding the, the money that these, these traders spend or, or put forward, year two, we had more traders than we could use because markets work like magic. Uh, if there is somebody buying, there will be somebody selling. And if that is not happening naturally, there are ways to make it happen even we have cases in kenya where refugees themselves were supported by wfp to open up shops and then they again became part of that solution uh, it may not always be possible and so for us you know we wfp was built on distributing food there are cases where nothing else works and you have to bring in food uh, but if you can keep that uh, for the shortest time possible it's best for everyone Great. And th thank you for that. We're going to officially move into the optional hour. So I know some of you have to drop as we move into your workday or move into sleep time, depending on where you are in the world. So I just wanted to note that I want to officially thank our speakers, Fuat, Tiziana and Catherine. Thank you so much. And I know they're willing to stick around for a bit. So uh, yeah, thank you Fuat, for another 10 minutes. So uh, with that, just we're, we're officially closing out the uh, webinar and moving into discussion. So I'll continue to facilitate with Catherine and Florence's help as well as Shaleen. Great. So Kelsey, do you want to tee off the next question? Yeah, it looks like there's somebody, this might be um, a question for, for Fuad a little bit as well. Um, can any of the speakers speak about the different roles or capacities of local governments versus national and regional governments in emergency food planning? Um, I may say a few things. Uh, I mean, at the, at the, first of all, um, people always think that refugees are hunchbacks and their hunches on, on their back. If if you start thinking that way, you know, there's always going to be a resistance between two communities. But instead of thinking that way, as I said, you know, think about them, try to use them, try to uh, think them as an asset. That's what we uh, did here uh, and try to, because they're so uh, people with abilities, all of, most of them came from their countries and they had some businesses or they had some uh, uh, maybe craftsmanships, you know, they're, some of them are handymen. We, we try to uh, categorize them. I mean, it's a wrong word, but yes, we, uh, we made surveys and, um, uh, and try to uh, shine their good parts. And then we started using them on their parts. And that way they started to become uh, a positive uh, effect on the economy. And, uh, and now I told you on the last meeting, uh, $350 million of export they have made so far. So that's, that's a very good number for our city. Uh, we are like number six or number seven in Turkey as an export import foreign trade. Uh, and their participation is more than three, four percent, maybe five percent now. So that's a big number. So instead of giving them money, we could have we could have keep them in the uh, refugee camps, but instead of doing that and uh, spending money on them, we, give them opportunity to establish their own businesses. So now we can uh, collect the fruit from the tree. Yeah. Thank you. And as sort of a follow-up to that, um, we have somebody asking a question about how you 
uh, motivate municipal governments to understand that this is a very important thing to act on and prepare for. Kelsey, maybe before we get to that, it looks like Catherine had her hand up too. Maybe she wanted to respond to Fuwa. I'm sorry, yeah. Oh, that's okay. No, thank you. I just wanted to add on to, um, to what Fuat had mentioned. Um, the question was about the capacities of the local governments. Um, yeah, and I think they are all. For our context, um, three key things. Um, the districts or sub-national governments have what they call disaster committees. And so these in some areas just need to be strengthened and uh, these are done either through coordination, through trainings, which WFP together with other partners have, um, and UNICEF very um, jointly have done this, but also most importantly, taking them through uh, their district development plans, the subnational development plans, incorporating up to the national level, incorporating issues of contingency plans to take care of um, these recurring um, emergencies like districts that are prone to receiving um, refugees for over years, we all know, and these assessments are done. But also thirdly, then for the government of Uganda, with the corporate, um, the comprehensive refugee response framework, um, significant resources have been invested into these districts that are always receiving refugees, and therefore their capacity is being built, not only in terms of delivery of um, a response, but also for them to make the most out of, um, of the, the responses that uh, the, the, the refugee response um, actions. And that's how they are able to produce, as you listen to one of the videos, that the, the communities look at the influx as an advantage because they're able to um, sell their food commodities um, easily here getting market. So yes, they're producing, they're ignited to produce, for a bigger market beyond the refugees, but in case the influx occurs, then they are also able to benefit in terms of the immediate um, market or consumption um, within the area. Over to you. So Kelsey, do you wanna rephrase that question? Yeah, yeah, um, this person is asking about um, ways to motivate municipal governments to understand that emergency food plans are a really important thing to prepare So is that for Fuat or maybe I, Fuat would like? Uh, I'm having trouble hearing you. I'm sorry. Can oh, you... I'm sorry. Um, the question was um, how you motivate municipal governments to understand that this is a really important thing to prepare for and to act on. Um, actually, uh, the, the problem just happened in like a few months. So millions of people just influxed in the, the country. So uh, you don't have to uh, poke someone to uh, realize this because we were all poked uh, in very short time. So either we have to react fast or we could have done nothing. So we acted very fast, the government and the local governments. Uh, we, the, the problem just born, uh, we were born into the problem right that moment. So we have yeah. to do something. Yeah, and then we uh, established this governance model in like, let's say two years and our, uh, our municipality and two or three more uh, received the most uh, refugees from the border because we are right at the border like 50 70 kilometers from Aleppo and maybe 15 20 kilometers to the border the the, the city center is very close so the people just started flowing flowing and flowing hundreds of thousands of people started coming in like few weeks so you have to act fast. That's yeah. the, somehow the, the, the problem created the, the, the solution. The solution. Yeah, yeah thank, thanks, Fuat. And I think for Amanda, I think, you know, this is a really tough problem for people like us and the Food Foundation, right? Um, WFP is like getting people to plan ahead and think about this. And for us, it's sharing stories like Fuat, sharing the data that's saying, hey, these refugees, it can happen to everyone. It's happening within the US, it's happening within Canada, right? This is not just international, what we thought about the refugee problem 20 years ago. You have lots of, because of disasters, climate change, increasing conflicts, et cetera. 
lots more migrations of people around the world. They're landing in cities. And although it is a national government, international organizations that often come in when it's at a massive scale, it's also stressing these local systems and they need to be prepared for it. And that's what Fuat's saying. And that's why the Zanti up is getting a lot of attention because they they then acted as a municipality to help address this in coordination with the national government because they realize they're here for the long haul. Let's make it an asset, not just a drain. And we just have to keep getting that message out there so that uh, metropolitans uh, areas are really aware. We do that with our international partners, C40, et cetera. Um, we certainly try to do that you know, through the Feeding Cities group as well. That's great. I want to get to Helen's question, Kelsey, because she had a little bit different twist. I think this is more for World Food Program anyway. It's on infant feeding. Is that correct? Yeah, infant and young child feeding and emergencies. So this person is wondering um, <clears throat> where these plans get integrated into resilience plans, um, specifically in a situation where you have an influx of refugees that's not considered an emergency. So those aid organizations are not showing up to provide assistance, um, leaving the burden on, on local municipalities. Oh, that's such a great question, Helen. And I think Shaleen, you also responded to that. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I, I understood uh, if the, the, is the question more on how to provide nutrition assistance or how to gap fill? Helen, um, feel free to come on camera and ask. Yeah, yeah, please do. Helen, don't be shy. This is informal. Okay, so I'm taking the question to mean the Shaleen, what was your take on it too? She says, my area is infant. Yeah, so go ahead. So um, it's, it's a really great question, actually. So um, she points out that, um, that um, an emergency isn't an emergency until we reach 5,000 people. So in Europe, in a lot of Western European cities at the moment, we have maybe local authorities are experiencing hundreds of asylum seekers. Since the Afghan crisis, now we're we're really receiving more. And in um, Birmingham, for example, um, the Home Office will place asylum seekers and refugees in accommodation. And, and the local authority doesn't really have responsibility for those asylum seekers. Um, and the, there are lots of challenges. So basically, even though the the local authority obviously does have a duty of care for citizens in its city. Um, it doesn't really integrate its services into support those in um, home office related accommodation. I'm really sorry there's noise here. Um, so um, I think the question is about the, the Western European countries and cities now especially, is um, as we start to reach thousands, and we will reach it, and those of you that are keeping an eye on UK news, um, we've already gone from hundreds crossing um, Calais 2000 this year, then how can local authorities really learn from these kind of case studies and start preparing? And at the moment, there's a lot of tension, I'd say, between local authorities and national governments about where the responsibility lies. And the Home Office have now forced uh, local authorities, literally in the past day, to start accepting, for example, child migrants. Um, so, you know, it's, it, it may not be classified as a technical emergency, but we are heading that way. And obviously those of you that are aware of what's going on at the border between Poland and um, uh, Belarus, there are lots of issues and things to think of. And it's, it's for those of us that are real practitioners and really focused on getting food to vulnerable communities is to think about how we're going to do that effectively in the coming year. And it's not so easy. And we have a lot to learn from those um, in, for example, from the World Food Programme and elsewhere about how we can do that and negotiate the national versus local politics too. So um, one of the things that um, was mentioned was human rights was placed at the heart of that strategy. And so um, the city of Birmingham, for example, is now recognizing the right to food as very important for city food policy and how do we use that and what political maneuvering do we need to um, make in order to start 
getting local authorities to respond more effectively to emergencies like the migrant crisis or even the pandemic. So the question relates to breastfeeding. I'll just give an example. In one of these home office hostels, I discovered a newborn was had arrived um, literally maybe a fortnight ago, but there's, there's not necessarily any integration into local services because of course these are people with no um, no access to public or state support and so they're, they're, they're exceptionally vulnerable. So I don't, I don't know if anyone here, Tatiana or anyone else has any response to that. It's, it's really difficult. It's... Yeah, it's a very difficult question and, and not one I have any experience of. So it, I think it's, it's something that we, that kind of needs a collective thinking. And, and you're, if you're an expert of infant and young child feeding, when it comes to WFB and to UNICEF, we have the tools, we have the specialized nutritious food, and we have thresholds and measurements uh, for, for knowing when a child is malnourished and what to do. Uh, it's a machine that we can trigger very easily, but not one that in, in developed countries, in Western countries, we're used to seeing. It's a little bit like uh, for us uh, humanitarian workers, you always hope that you don't, don't catch malaria where you're back home on holidays because God knows what the hospital will do, will do with you because they've never seen malaria in real life. And, and, and it's not just that uh, levels of emergency, but it's also government willingness. So it's, you don't just need 5,000 refugees, you need 5,000 refugees and a government that is requested uh, international support, which we don't expect to happen in most of our Western countries. So I don't actually know how to deal with this. One thing for sure from experience is again, talking to the refugees, talking to the people, having somebody who can talk to them in their own language, trying to integrate as much of the support also in terms of knowledge as early as possible because then yeah, cultural issues come in when it comes to breastfeeding or not breastfeeding, feeding young children. Uh, you probably know it better than me. Um, I think it's it's going to be increasingly a problem that we see, and I don't know if there's any preparation being done for that. To be honest, I, I have Sounds absolutely no knowledge of how we do this in the West, if we do it. But we don't. I don't think we do, right, Shalene? I think Shalene and I have been talking and we're saying we're not doing this in the West, right? Oh, Helen? Yeah, I, oh, yeah, I think sorry. that we need to. Sorry, yeah, that, that, that this is now the beginning of a very important learning journey and we have to learn quickly because things are moving so quickly. So, yeah. That's great. Helen, you actually had your hand up. If you'd like to come on camera and share, please go ahead. Hi. Yay. Um, I, I didn't realize I had my hand up. I was just typing away in the chat. Okay. Uh, there's so much to learn and there's so much happening in all the areas of the world, except here in Europe and in the North America. And yeah. uh, what I just cited in my comment here was that <clears throat> the example of wildfires in Canada, where thousands of young families who worked in the oil fields that were affected had to evacuate very quickly. Um, and they had infants and young children and the government didn't ask UNICEF to step in and set up a nutrition cluster or anything like that. Um, but yet there were all these families that were, they had to go hundreds of miles to escape from the wildfires and people donated all kinds of products which were made into little food bank shops, but there wasn't any strategy to provide yeah. safe or hygienic or nutritious food. Um, there was a lot of processed food and the toddlers were getting sort of hooked on it, very expensive, very sugary. Um, formula just laid out on the tables for people to take and no skilled support. And it was the NGOs locally who got together, formed a coalition, set up telephone helplines and support. And I mean, if you looked at the evacuation centers, they didn't have a milk kitchen like you would have if, in a sort of 
your typical humanitarian emergency. So people were just washing their bottles in the bathroom of the sports center, where of course everyone already had nor norovirus because they're all crammed together. And that, that's, uh, yeah. that's not what we're expecting to see in Canada, right? Well, well, Helen, it's the same in the U.S. and that's why, so I'm, I'm in the U.S. based in Madison, Wisconsin, and I created, that's why I created this whole company. It was too important. This is where the, in North America and in Europe, our, um, right, our inexperience with refugees and our inexperience with vulnerable food supplies, right, we are the most vulnerable. It is no surprise to me, Florence, that about half of our audience who signed up for this webinar, Helen, from the US and Canada. And it's because right now we're struggling with refugee situations, right? We, we, we just had an influx <laughs> of refugees, not just from our Southern border, but elsewhere. And we have no, as you said, no strategy, no thinking about how to prepare for it, et cetera. And, and you know, I think it's going to be a matter of, of learning it from international experiences, which we're very bad at doing um, because we think we know it all, right? So, yeah, and I think that's what Shalene is saying too and, and that there's this whole learning curve and it has to be done very, very quickly. I know, and in the case of babies, like if you have two weeks of a mother being given formula and not help for a breastfeeding yeah. problem, yeah. breastfeeding's over. So what I'm going, what we're going to see, this is why I was driving me crazy in the UK when Afghan families just literally arrived and all this was happening and the newspapers are saying, oh, we've got to collect formula for all these babies. And what we're going to get is yet another freedom of information requests, put together some information and write a report. <laughs> this is how we failed these people again. Again and again. And I'm not laughing because I mean, it is just, it's, stunning the incompetence and it's stunning everyone thinks you know the food system in Canada and the U.S. and how we deal with all of these crises it is the incompetence is stunning and and it is in places like Turkey right where although this was a shock right you heard Fuat say in no way were we prepared or thought that we would have an invasion of hundreds of thousands of refugees and it felt like an invasion to them at the time right all of a sudden flooding in but they did have an emergency food plan in place because they were prepared for border conflict, et cetera, right? So they did have something in place that they could tweak. There was a sense of vulnerability that allowed them to plan, that gave them the motivation to plan. They do have stockpiles of food. What's happening in Europe and the US and North America is that there is no sense of vulnerability and therefore there is no sense of planning except for some old cold war, I think right, uh, uh, models. So yeah, this is just hugely interesting. I just wanna make sure, are there any other questions out there? I feel like this is a master class coffee chat where if we were all in, in some coffee shop or something in London, it would just be amazing. Any other, any other questions out there for those hanging, hanging out with, oh yeah, Kath, no, that's my hand. Anyone else? Oh, I'd just like to say that um, there is a, a research project going on on food resilience in London. Yes. Uh, so and I was I was part mm. of that. So some places are looking at it. I wouldn't say they've mm. got a plan in place, but um, the, people are waking up a little bit, especially with COVID and the shortages, which I know you're going to highlight a different time. Yeah. That we can't just assume that everything will always be there for us all. No. And Helen, take a look at our website, Feeding Cities Group. Totally. Uh, because you'll see the to... you'll see the resilience plans for Boston and Toronto and others. Some are right, and and we certainly know. Florence, Thank sorry, you. go ahead. Yeah, I have a question for Catherine. Um, you spoke about how um sharing of information was really really key uh, in your work with different actors. Um, what sort of mechanisms do you use? Just a real practical question. You know, how do you disseminate that information? Who manages that? Um, and and how do you make sure that the right information gets to the right people? <coughs> Thank you, Flores. <coughs> Sorry, just a minute. The, there are several mechanisms, but um, at the, um, and these are different levels. Let's look at the settlement level for Uganda context. It's a refugee settlement and not the camp. Um, aware of the, the, just the small difference. 
Uh, but um, one of the, for us is through the regular um, monthly coordination meetings um, led, chaired by the government, um, the representative that sits at the, the settlement level, um, who we call the commandant, but basically uh, the government representative at the, at the refugee settlement. And um, all sectors um, are represented, all partners are represented. So on a monthly basis, it's scheduled um, and it's um, structured. Um, most of the meetings are structured except for emergencies where they're basically ad hoc. But also the uh, other platforms now with the WhatsApps, um, then the reports sharing, like say if a post distribution uh, monitoring has been done and the type of um, food nutrition assessments have been done. There's dissemination that is done of the findings, uh, but also most importantly, the joint, uh, the joint um, consultative meetings with the communities. These are still coordinated by the, 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 the government representative, but even when organized by say a protection team and the focus like now we are in the 16 days of activism, and so we have protection partners that are leading on a number of, um, of um, the voice of um, the fight against gender-based violence. And so community meetings are organized um, at the village level, you say the lowest the, um, um, governance unit, but also at the, at the settlement level. And so there are like a multiple of them. Uh, both in, in terms of interface, face-to-face uh, -face, uh, sessions, uh, going out into the communities, sharing of reports, emails that are um, platforms that have been created, both emails and, uh, and for WhatsApps, for keeping every each one um, on top of the business. But the, the person that holds all of us accountable is the representative from the government and they are strong in this. And so like they call everybody to order if they are policies, or, or decrease being made or any changes, like say when we had the COVID context and therefore there was um, um, COVID guidelines. And so they are the enforcers at the, at the settlement level. And so they monitor um, and we hold ourselves accountable. If we are going to go and mobilize communities, for instance, for food assistance, and there are these COVID guidelines. So we hold discussions uh, with um, the commandant, um, the, the government representative, with who calls the other stakeholders um, and therefore, if there are any adjustments being made in a given context, the government representative takes, takes the central role in, in, in this. That's how basically it happens on a, an everyday basis. Thank you. Great, right, thank you. It's really interesting to hear. I mean, it is clearly a really strong structure of information flow from the top down and the bottom up. And it speaks to that point, um, the, the questions that people are asking earlier about how, how to get that, um, that really strong national leadership on these issues. So yeah, thank you, really um, interesting. Uh, Tiziana, oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. You're just gonna call on Tiziana too, probably. Yeah, yeah and Tiziana, I do. And before that, Anastasia, I know we haven't heard from you and you, and you are part of this small group if you feel comfortable coming on camera and if you wanna add any questions and Amanda too, well, you know, feel free to pop on camera. We're very informal, so don't worry about how you look. Tiziana? No, I just wanted to, to add that uh, this is possibly one of the hardest problems. Uh, I used to say there, there's nowhere like a refugee camp to spread uh, fake news. You know, anything you say mm -hmm. can be manipulated. We're talking about very vulnerable people. And it's really important to progressively and constantly build the trust uh, because you know, whenever you're, you're feeling vulnerable, it's very easy to feel that you know, WFP or whoever is, is mandated to support you is not doing it well enough for some reason. Uh, and it's very difficult, I'm sure Catherine relates to that, to just go to those refugee camps and say, you know, sometimes we have to cut rations, for example. And just to say, you know, this is beyond our control. We are on your side. We do the best that we can. And sometimes this is what we can, just this is what we can do and we can't do much better. And so, you know, we are improving. We are also learning. 
with time, you know, 10 years ago, we, we, we were all scared and saying, oh my God, refugees will soon talk to us on WhatsApp. And now we are talking to them on WhatsApp sometimes. So we are trying to use all the forums that we can, whenever we can. It's a very delicate uh, issue that involves trust, that involves finding people that can mediate between us and them in a way that they trust. Uh, so finding community leaders, finding women leaders who can, on the one hand, bring us the issues that maybe refugees won't bring to us because of a variety of reasons, and at the same time report back on what we have to say. And it's, it's one of the most difficult parts of the job that we do, I think. And so I don't know if there is one solution for everything, but it's really about constantly, constantly trying to communicate, trying to understand, trying to talk, uh, never miss an opportunity to talk to people and, and, and hear what they have to say. Great, thanks. Hi, Amanda, good to see you. It's just nice to say hello to people in person who've been here with us for two hours. Now we feel like you're part of this little family here. Yes. I, it started at 6 a.m. for me, so I have to say I haven't really gotten ready for the day. Um, someone, I saw someone ask in the chat where I'm at, and I'm in Del Norte County, which is the far northern county in California. Most people think California ends at San Francisco, but you keep driving for seven hours and you get to us. And this is such an interesting conversation. Um, for me in a lot of different ways. I have a background in, in international development, but I now work in a very, we're USDA far and remote one and two levels where um, we live in a context that is, can be isolated from the rest of surrounding communities very, very easily. Our biggest city is over two hours away. We have one thoroughfare that gets shut down by landslides a lot. Um, and one of the, the things to me that it's really interesting to hear about the context in Canada and you talking about the United States, I think that so many people are under this false uh, sense of security that yeah. we have food, we'll always have food. We don't have to think about not having food because if, if nothing else, helicopters will fly in bucket, bucket loads and sling right. them down and drop them and like everything will be fine. So it's not that's something right. we have to think about and worry about. And that's, right. so that's one of the things in trying to work in my community and lead a transformation of the food system and lead a preparedness and resiliency plan and scenarios training and all of that. If I feel like it fall, the city government and county government are all just kind of like, ah, oh, we don't really need to worry about that. That's not a priority. Um, and so I see a lot of overlap with, with refugees. Like I said, our refugees would be more from wildfire or, or coming in our, to our community because they're leaving big cities um, because of COVID or because of the prices and coming so we do, we have a lot of people coming here that are living in tents and living in cars. Um, and so I see a lot, even though it's not technically refugees in the context of how we're speaking about it here, it's, there's a lot of overlap. Displaced um, people. Yeah. Yeah. Amanda, that's great. And we should talk offline. If you want to shoot us an email, we're doing some work in that area up in Portland where you may be, um, you know, just sort of on the cusp. I've been to your neck of the woods, as they say, and for everyone on here, it's one of the most beautiful places in, in our country, but very remote, as, as you said. Uh, so wonderful. Thank, thank you for that context. And um, yeah, and thanks for joining and popping online. We know, yeah, it's very early out on the West Coast. Thank you. Anyone else would like to add a final question or chat? All right. Well, I think Florence and Chalene, maybe we'll stay on for a quick debrief, but everyone else, thank you. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for staying on, joining. Love that we have students, people working out there in all areas. Um, really appreciate it. Amanda, hope we get to chat more. Thanks, everyone.